Hey everyone, this is Pallabi and I'm back with the 10th game of the book Chess, The Art of Logical Thinking by Neil MacDonald. This game was played between Shirov and Barif in uh, 2003 in Wykenzie. The opening played was French Defense. Before I show the game, let me tell you some important things to know. In chess strategy, there's a constant balance between pursuing long-term goals and addressing immediate needs. Sometimes, prioritizing long-term gains can backfire in the short term, as shown in Game 5 when Sokolov acquired the bishop pair but got quickly checkmated by none due to misjudgment of timing. Pawn structure plays a crucial role in determining whether to focus on long-term plans or immediate positional needs. Uh, there are three types of positions, like open position, closed position, and semi-open position. Open positions demand rapid piece development to control the center, while closed positions allow for more deliberate development and strategic maneuvering. Semi-open positions fall between these extremes, requiring vigilance or at all times. So this chapter explores various E4 openings in chess, highlighting uh, different approaches to managing the time factor so some openings lead to immediate tactical bat battles reminiscent of open games, while others emphasize slow maneuvering and strategic planning. So without further ado, let's see the game. So I started with e4, occupying the center and uh, freeing the queen and the bishop, controlling the d5 and f5 square. Black played e6, the French defense. This move prepares black with d5 um, to dispute the e4 pawn center. White played d4. White values space for its potential to enhance peace mobility and tactical activity. d5. Black completes his central pawn barrier. In the French defense, Black's bishop on c8 is unhappy because it gets blocked by the uh, e6 pawn. This makes it a problem for Black. But in chess, you sometimes have to sacrifice a piece's activity for safety. Knight c3. Once more, the player's style shows in their move choice. A more cautious player might have played knight d2, known as the Tarash variation, to prevent the knight from getting pinned by bishop to b4. Would be unwise because white can easily respond with c3. So knight c3, now black played knight f6. As I mentioned earlier, black would have chosen the more adventurous bishop b4. But Barif, uh, Barif prefers traditional approach, developing his uh, king's knight and attacking the e4 pawn, known as the classical variation. Now white played e5. White maintains his piece advantage instead of e5. If e takes d5, then e takes d5 would be no more than equal as black's queen, uh, queen's bishop uh, suddenly has an open diagonal. So white played e5. Black played knight f d7. Placing the knight on this square is optimal because when combined with black's next two moves, it applies pressure to the white center. Now white played f4. White reinforces the e5 pawn's position with another pawn. If white had chosen the more common development move of uh, knight f3, then black could have play, uh, black could play c5 followed by knight c6, which would make it difficult for white to maintain a strong center. So after f4, now black played c5. It is vital that black generates counterplay by undermining the d4 pawn. This is especially attractive uh, target as the presen uh, presence of the white knight on c3 prevents it being supported by c2 to c3. Knight f3. White must support his center or else it will be overthrown by c takes d4. Knight c6. 
Bardiff ends up, uh, sorry, steps up the pressure by forcing White to attend once again to the threat of d4. Threat to d4. Now, White to bishop e3. An essential strengthening as White would lose both time and position after bishop e2. If instead bishop e2, then c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight takes d4, queen takes d4 and bishop c5. The bishop develops with the threat on the queen and it will be controlling this long diagonal. So white played bishop to e3 supporting the central pawn and as well as developing it. c takes d4. Not forced but black wants to clarify the situation in the center so that he can utilize the c5 square with his bishop. Knight takes d4. The bishop on e3 is somewhat limited by white's pawns on e5 and f4. But it plays a crucial role in controlling the dark squares against black's bishop. Thus making the move bishop takes d4 would be a mistake. Because of knight takes d4, knight takes d4, bishop c5. Now black is ready, already setting the stage to dominate the dark squares. So, white captured with the knight. Bishop c5. This puts the white knight in a pin and threatens queen b6, which would be most awkward in view of the double attack on d4 and b2. So, white played queen d2. The best reply which defends the bishop on e3 and clears the way for castling queen side. Bishop takes d4. Black's decision to start the exchange sequence uh, is sensible because he has limited space and every piece that gets removed will relieve the congestion in his position. So white played bishop takes d4. If black now plays short castle or kingside castle then it is worth white spending a tempo on bishop e3 to keep his excellent dark squared bishop on the board. So after bishop takes d4, black captured knight takes d4. Certainly a strategic master like Bariv won't permit the bishop to get away. Queen takes d4. Now white enjoys a slight advantage because as is often the case in the French defense, the dark squared bishop on c8 is the weakest minor piece on the board. Black played queen b6. Still, in the end game, it's tough to show that the weaker black bishop would help white win. So, Barib suggests trading queens. Queen d2, a bold response. White is ready to sacrifice one or more pawns on the queen side to secure an advantage in peace development and maintain the presence of both queens on the board. Queen takes b2. A bold and essential capture because if white had chosen a slower move, um, then would have simply castled queen side in the initiative without losing any material. Rook b1. The black queen has to be forced on a3 in order to uh, gain, in order for white to gain time for an attack with his knight. Queen a3. The only way for the queen to save herself, knight b5. White must aggressively uh, play. If they focus solely on peace development, Black will use a6 to control the b5 square and hamper white's attack. So knight b5 attacking the queen and also threatening to move the knight to c7 and uh, double attack the king and the rook. Now black played queen takes a2. The black queen stays active on the queen side. White is now committed to winning through an aggressive attack knowing that black's advanced pawns will be crucial in the long term. Knight d6 check. This check is the correct way to disrupt the black king. Instead, if knight c7 check, it's a double attack, would be a serious mistake as after king d8, both the white rook and the knight are handling. So knight d6 check. Now black played king f8. In the obvious move was king e7, which keeps the option of involving the king's rook. Initially, it might seem like a mistake because white can respond with queen b4, threatening a future discovered check on the king. However, 
after a5 the knight f5 check and then king d8 queen e7 check king c7 queen d6 check king d8 and the game could lead to a sharp draw alternatively after a5 white can respond with knight takes c8 check then king d8 while white gains a temporary piece advantage their attack loses steam as both the queen and knight becomes vulnerable additionally if white plays queen takes b7 black can reply with rook e8 and moving the white queen to safety leads to the loss of the rook on b1 due to a check so black played king f8 now white played a good move rook d1 it might seem strange to move the rook away from the b file but shirov is planning to castle and then attack along the f file with the move f4 to f5 if black tries to prevent white from castling by moving the queen um, by moving the queen as happens in the game then the rook on d1 will be in a good position to support an attack along the d file with the move from c2 to c4 so after rook d1 now black played queen b2 the queen goes back to b6 to disrupt white's attacking plans she briefly stops the move c2 to c4 and um, by passing through b2 because white doesn't want to trade queens okay so after queen b2 now white played bishop e2 shirov patiently develops his bishop as he sees that black's next move won't solve his defensive problems queen b6 the queen is now stopping white's castling but it all begins to fall apart after white's reply which is a good move c4 with a lead in development white strives to open lines this is painful move for black to mate as d takes c4 uh, would lead to knight takes c8 rook takes c8 and then queen takes d7 gains a piece for white so after c4 black played d4 this move keeps the d file closed for now as white doesn't want to swap queens by capturing on d4 however it also blocks the diagonal from a7 to g1 which means white can consider castling again now white played bishop f3 white should not rush because if they castle right now then black can play d3 with a check which wins black a piece so before anything else white needs to move the bishop out of the way and they do this by efficiently moving the bishop to f3 attacking the b7 again a5 after failing to prevent white's progress but its only hope lies in his advanced pawns unfortunately it will take quite some time before his pawn poses a real threat castle kingside castle white has successfully reached their goal the, their king is now safe from central threats and the rook on f1 is prepared to join the attack along the f file the black pieces are disorganized with both rooks having no significant roles and the bishop on c8 is trapped by the knight consequently it's not uh, surprising that sacrificial tactics are now possible now black played d3 it's a check discover check by the queen black wants to bring the queen into the action it's hard to suggest any other move because for example if black plays knight c5 instead of d3 to free the bishop then queen takes d4 would give white a big advantage so d3 check now white played king h1 unlike the vulnerable black king the white king can observe the unfolding events without any danger queen d4 the queen moves to a good central position blocking the d file and guarding the a1 square with hopes of supporting an advancing uh, advancing pawn later she can be backed up by moves like knight c5 and bishop d7 
However, Shirov disrupts Black's plans with his next move. Knight b5. Good move. A surprising and powerful response. It was hard to predict because the knight seemed to be on its best square on d6 already. It's not easy to spot backward knight moves if black plays now queen takes c4. It helps white by opening up the c file. The game might proceed with knight d6, queen d4 and then rook c1, knight b6 supporting the bishop, then rook c7 giving white a strong attacking position. And after knight d6, if the queen goes to c2 trying to trade the queens, then queen e3 with the intention of rook c1 and to capture the bishop on c8. So after knight b5, black did queen c5. The, the black queen has no choice but to retreat from her ideal square. Queen takes d3. Now the black blockade in the center has collapsed and with all black's hopes of a successful defense, uh, let's compare how the white and black pieces are positioned. Rooks. White has one rook controlling the open file and um, another centrally located ready to support an attack with f4, f5. The black rooks, on the other hand, are still in corners, uh, not playing an active role. Now the knights. White's knight is quite dynamic and is about to occupy the influential d6 square. The black man is vulnerable and cannot move without facing a checkmate threat on d8 with the queen okay and now the bishops white's bishops has a long diagonal to exert influence while the black bishop is currently immobilized with no valuable moves or available moves so, and now the queens. Both queens are well placed and ready for the upcoming battle. And kings, the white king is peacefully positioned and doesn't obstruct uh, any pieces. However, the black king uh, hinders the black rook, his own rook, and is an exposed target. So, white has achieved all this while sacrificing just one pawn and making it a great deal. Now, black played g6. Black creates a path for their king to move to g7, which will also free up the h8 rook. And additionally, they try to discourage white from breaking through on f5 again, but this effort won't succeed. Knight d6. Back again, and this time with the threat of knight takes e8, winning a piece. So now black played knight b6. The knight runs for its life, but it also uh, proved to be a target on b6. Rook b1. A different approach here. Black's queen is the main thing, keeping his position stable. So white intends to push it back so that White's own queen can take control of d4, white, which is a crucial square in the center. Now black plays king g7. Now black threatens to develop uh, with bishop to d7 and then uh, knight takes b7 and then queen takes c4. With the king on f8, this could have, have answered, uh, this could have been answered by, for example, bishop d7, knight b7, queen c4. Now, uh, queen d6 check. So, if the with the queen on f8, this could have been answered with queen d6 check and um, picking up the knight on f8. So, therefore, white must act as uh, act fast to keep the black pieces bottled up. So, after rook b1 and then king g7, 
Now white played rook b5, a good move. The black queen is now forced to move from her advantageous position and simultaneously the rook occupies a spot where it all, uh, where, it, where it will play a crucial role in the game's final combative stage. Queen c7. This is the sole square where safety is guaranteed against the advancing white pieces. Queen d4, a good move. White's queen assumes uh, control of the center dark squares with gain of uh, time by hitting the knight. Knight d7, a miserable retreat after which the black bishop is boxed and uh, boxed in again. f5, a good move with all pieces optimally positioned. White must launch a strong attack, breaking through black's defenses with sacrifices to target the black king. G takes f5. If black had disregarded white's advance with a4, they could still have opened up a path uh, forward with f takes e6, f takes e6, and then bishop g4, all without the need for sacrifices. So after f5, black played g takes f5, and then white played knight takes f5 check. Now we can see why Shirov wanted his queen on d4. Now black captured e takes f5. If instead king f8, then knight d6 followed by bishop h5 and the f7 pawn drops. So e takes f5. Now white played e6 check. A deadly discovered check with rip which rips open the king's defenses. Knight e5. A desperate move of, uh, but after knight f6. Then rook takes f5, queen e7 supporting the knight. Bishop d5. The knight on f6 is suddenly attacked with uh, three of the pieces three times with a quick checkmate looming after the unstoppable rook takes f6. So black played knight e5 instead of knight f6. Rook takes e5. Now the threats include rook c5, discovered check, wins the queen. Black played f6. It's the only way to continue the fight, but it's a bleak prospect when facing a tactical chess expert like Shirov. Rook takes f5. The rook is causing chaos along the fifth rank. Now, black has to deal with queen takes f6 check. And there will be a checkmate on the following move. Rook f8. At last, a black rook makes a contribution to the game, but it's way too late to make any difference to the outcome. Bishop d5. White defends, uh, defends his passed pawn, uh, which keeps the wretched black bishop entombed on c8 and uncovers an attack by the rook on f1 against f6. Queen e7. Um, the queen fights valiantly but with so little help from the other piece is unable, unable to rescue the situation. Rook h5. The f6 square is defended three times and not vulnerable to attack by the white bishop. Uh, as it is on a dark square. This pawn is on a dark square and the bishop is on a light square color. And so therefore white uses his greater mobility to focus on a softer target, the h7 pawn. Against which the bishop can also apply its power to attack. Now after rook h5, black played king h8. If instead rook h8, then rook g5 check. Uh, since this pawn is pinned, black cannot capture it with the pawn. King h6 and then rook takes f6 check, king takes g5, queen f4 check, king h5, uh, then rook h6 checkmate or bishop f3 that is also a checkmate. So black played king h8, now white played bishop e4. The h7 pawn is now certain to be captured with it any chance of the black king finding refuge from the relentless attack is lost. Bishop takes e6. Um, I suppose black was resolute in trying to develop this bishop uh, before giving up but it's certainly not a noteworthy debut. Rook takes h7 check. The rook has had a wonderful career on the 5th rank, but of course, every rook aspires to go to the magical 7th rank, especially if it wins the opponent's queen. 
Now queen takes h7, bishop takes h7, king takes h7 and queen e4 check. White seizes the bishop, um, gaining a substantial material advantage. Shirov demonstrated excellent initiative by utilizing the entire board for his maneuvers and adapting his strategy based on the position's requirements. So here black resigned. Now uh, let's look at some principles to keep in mind. Occupy the center with pawns, develop your pieces towards the center, castle as early as possible, whenever possible develop with a threat, do not move same piece twice in the opening and neglect other pieces development. Occupy weak squares or holes in enemy's position uh, with your pieces. Rooks belong on open files or files likely to be opened. Whenever possible, place your rooks on 7th or 8th rank. Put bishops on open diagonals. Thank you for watching. Hope you like this video as well. Please like, comment and subscribe to my channel. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.